You are listening to the African Campfire Stories podcast. The African Campfire Stories podcast is a podcast program that is dedicated to the telling of African history stories and events. Welcome. To bring you African history, we have to go through a lot of information including names of people and names of places. Should you pick up anything we get wrong or if you just need to reach us, please use our website www.africancampfirestories.com. You can also search for African Campfire Stories on social media. Before you begin listening to today's episode, we would like to suggest that you check out the previous episodes of our Cold War Porn series so that it will be much easier for you to follow our story. That is, check out episodes starting from episode 2 to episode 7. Without much further ado, here is today's episode. This is episode 8, Cold War Pawns, the Berlin Conflict and the Korean War. On the last episode, we discussed the situation in China that would lead that country to become entangled into the Cold War. But no matter where the Cold War spread to in the many years that it lasted, the cradle of the Cold War was Europe. Amongst the thorniest issues of the Cold War, post-war Berlin was the worst as far as both the USA and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics were concerned. As World War II in Europe was approaching its end, it became clear to the Western Allies that it was important to agree on post-war borders with the USSR's leader, Joseph Stalin. The issue of making agreements with Stalin and Stalin not keeping those agreements was discussed in our previous episodes of the Cold War Pawn series, especially on episode 5 and 6. Part of reaching a borders agreement with Stalin was to limit the reach of his armies. The Western Allies, Britain and America could see that the USSR would possibly take more of Germany if there was no formal agreement to stop the USS armies from doing so. Earlier in our Cold War Pawn series, we spoke about Tehran, Yalta and the Potsdam conferences that were held between the Western Allies and Stalin. We stated that British Prime Minister Winston Churchill even tried to do an underhand, under-the-table secret deal with Stalin in order to agree with the latter on the control of various Eastern European countries. But the Americans were never privy to the deal at that time. It was never an official deal. All of this shows the concern in the West about the USSR's occupation of European countries and the possible spread of communism that would surely follow that occupation. This wasn't a new fear. We have seen that from the birth of the USSR, Britain and the USA were amongst the countries who tried to strangle the USSR as it was being born. Episode 4 discusses this in detail. Winston Churchill had been among the key Westerners who had been in the forefront of opposition to the USSR from early on in the 20th century all the way into the late 1930s. In any case, one of the key wartime agreements between the West and Stalin had to do with Germany and Berlin in particular. It was agreed that the USSR armies would stop east of the Elbe River in Germany and the Western powers would stop west of that river. The Elbe River cuts Germany into two, starting from the North Sea all the way down into modern-day Czech Republic. Occupying the west of the Elbe, would be the USA, Britain and France. <laughs> yes, France as well. Though she was demolished by the Nazi armies early in the Second World War in 1940, France would also get a share in the post-war occupation of Germany. This artificial propping up of a country that had been laid down on its knees during most of the war was another trick of the Western Allies, especially Britain. They were attempting to create a Western European front that could stand against the USSR in the post-war period. Churchill was afraid that the USA would leave Europe after the war and thus only Britain would be left to face off with the very much emboldened USSR. Using the Elbe River as a border had many problems. The main problem was that Berlin would lie smack in the middle of the USSR's portion of Germany. 
So the Western Allies devised a smart plan that would allow them to occupy Berlin. That plan involved the splitting up of Berlin into eastern and western zones of occupation. Remember earlier in this series we stated that this ubiquitous splitting up of countries and territories into capitalist and communist zones proved to be a disaster. Almost every time such a split occurred, you should rest assured that conflict would follow. We have already seen this with the Vietnam situation in episode 3. East Berlin would belong to the USSR and West Berlin would be shared between the USA, Britain and France. This meant that to reach their part of Berlin, the Western Allies would have to transverse the USSR zone of Germany. Later, during the Cold War period, the USSR was to act very irrationally when it came to Germany, and Berlin especially. If you study the history of the Cold War, you will not miss the unmistaken USSR's sensitivity about Germany. Before we go further, we should clarify this USSR concern about Germany and Berlin because it is very key to understanding the Cold War. What we should never forget is that the USSR armies fought Hitler's invading armies from the middle of the USSR all the way into the middle of Germany at very great cost in terms of the USSR lives lost. Also, the Nazi invasion of the USSR was very devastating to the USSR in economic and property terms. Whole towns and villages were wiped out in the process. Millions of USSR citizens were displaced from their homes. What happened to the USSR during the Second World War has very little parallel in the whole long history of mankind. Though the USSR was bound by the agreements made with the West in terms of splitting up Berlin into two war zones, the USSR had fought alone to capture Berlin. Close to a half a million USSR soldiers died to capture Berlin from the Nazis. After these horrendous human losses, the USSR had to give away part of Berlin to the West after the war. In the war overall, the USSR had lost more than any other country. It is said that about 70 to 80 million people lost their lives because of World War II. These figures encompasses the entire war and all the fronts. Europe, Africa, the USA, the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, the Baltic, Asia and the Pacific. About 24 million of those people were USSR citizens and soldiers. China was second with 20 million losses. China is in Asia though, as you know. In the European theatre of the war, many countries fought including Britain and its empire, France, the USSR and the USA. The USSR's losses were an aberration, so very unequal to what the USSR's Western allies lost. Some statistics and ratios go as far as saying that for every 10 German soldiers killed during World War II, about 7 were killed by the USSR. This means that the USA and Britain and their other allies only had to kill the other three Germans. There were three key allied countries that fought against Nazi Germany in the European theater during the Second World War. That is the USA, the USSR and Britain. The USA lost 418,500 people during World War II. That includes both soldiers and civilians. Britain lost 450,700. Again, this includes both soldiers and civilians. The USSR lost 24 million civilians and soldiers. Britain and the USA do not even come close. They didn't even lose 1 million, not even half a million. It doesn't take a genius to figure out who defeated the Nazis in World War II. It must also be remembered that only about 20 years earlier in World War I, Germany had also attacked the predecessor to the USSR, the Russian Empire, and tore its western lands into pieces. In that conflict, the Germans had extracted a severe and humiliating peace from the Russian Empire. No wonder then that the USSR was so paranoid about Germany and Berlin after World War II. As the Cold War started to get worse, Stalin began to suspect that his former Western allies were intending to revive German power. The USSR felt that so long as Germany was split into many occupation zones, the latter 
would not be able to pose a risk to the USSR. Stalin's paranoia was not unfounded. The Western allies, the USA, Britain, and now also France, were not interested in keeping Germany down forever. The Western allies understood that in order to get the European economy back on track, Germany had to be revived. Indeed, in 1949, Britain, France, and the USA combined their portions of Germany to form the Federal Republic of Germany, also known as West Germany. But even before the formation of West Germany in 1949, in 1946, the USA and Britain combined their portions of Berlin into one sector. France was also getting ready to join its portion of Berlin into this union. Thus, in June 1948, Stalin thought that it was time to kick the Western allies out of Berlin. Of course, he could not directly tell them to get out of Berlin. So, using the fact that Berlin was located about 100 miles inside the USSR zone of Germany, he blockaded the roads, canals, and railway lines that the Western allies were using to get from their part of Germany to their part of Berlin. This Berlin blockade lasted from June 1948 to May 1949. The Western Allies responded by instituting the Berlin Airlift, which was a scheme for providing their part of Berlin with resources and materials through the use of aircraft. So the Berlin blockade was a failure. But by this time, everyone was aware that the West and the USSR were in serious conflict. However, the West felt that so long as they have a nuclear weapons monopoly, Stalin would not be foolish enough to overreach himself. Therefore, it is not hard to understand why the explosion of the first USSR nuclear bomb was unsettling to the West. The one advantage that the West had over the USSR was gone. The last item of discussion for today's episode will be the Korean War. Korea is important in our story as it is the very first time that we saw the Cold War turn into a hot war. But it would not be the last. We also already discussed the case of Vietnam in episode 3. Vietnam was also an example of the Cold War turning hot. As we will see when we get to the parts of our Cold War series that deal directly with specific African countries, the Cold War itself was not necessarily the cause of the hot wars at all times. The civil war that broke out in Korea was probably going to happen in any case, with or without the Cold War. The pattern of the Cold War-related conflicts is easy to make out. It seems as if the Cold War followed troubled spots around the world. Countries that were strong and stable did not lend themselves to intense intervention from the two dueling superpowers. A cancer had to develop in some corner of planet Earth and then the Cold War politics would surely follow. That is the other point that makes the Cold War era intervention by the US and the USSR different from good old colonization. One gets a feeling that the USA and the USSR had a lot on their respective plates during the Cold War and thus did not welcome yet another country they had to go fight over. They only went into a given country because they felt they didn't have a choice. Each one felt that if I don't go in there, the other guy will. The cases where the superpowers went around looking for trouble during the Cold War era seem to be in the minority. Cases like that of the USSR intervention in Afghanistan in 1979 come to mind. But the Korean War that involved the USA and its allies was not going to occur without first the civil war taking place. This will mostly be the case when we get to tell the story of the African countries later on in this series. Korea cannot be separated from the bigger issues of Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin. Korea had been occupied by Japan up to World War II. When Stalin entered the war against Japan in 1945, his armies were able to quickly occupy parts of Korea. The USA dispatched representatives to Korea to ensure that Stalin didn't get all of Korea. It was agreed that Korea would be split into two zones of occupation, as was done with Germany. The USSR would occupy the north while the USA occupied the south. We have already talked about what happened when these two superpowers last split a country into zones of occupation. Trouble soon followed any such splits. Korea would be no different. 
After many arguments and counter-arguments about elections and other issues relating to the joint governance of Korea, the idea of two Koreas started to emerge. Enter Kim Il-sung, the grandfather of current North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Grandfather Kim Il-sung had spent time in exile in the USSR. And during the Chinese Civil War, his guerrillas had provided a lot of help to the Chinese communists. Mao Zedong was very grateful for this help and he would pay Kim back for this very help soon. After the Chinese Civil War, Mao sent back to Korea thousands of Korean troops who had helped the Chinese communists in the Chinese Civil War. From 1949, Kim had been badgering Stalin, asking for USSR military help to take over the whole of Korea. Stalin, always the cold calculator, wasn't sure at first. In Stalin's mind, helping friends just for the sake of helping was not desirable. There had to be something to gain for him also. In 1949, Kim's military forces started clashing with South Korean forces. Still, Stalin stayed put. But by 1950, Stalin changed his tune. He now gave Kim permission to invade South Korea, with the proviso that Mao Zedong should also send soldiers if needed. Mao, as radical as they come, gave a thumbs up. But Stalin had made it clear to Kim and Mao that the USSR military forces would not get directly involved in the shooting war. Stalin was okay with making the Cold War hot for North Korea and China. But because he was concerned that direct involvement by USSR troops might lead to World War III, he was going to keep the war cold for the USSR. Though it is now known that the USSR pilots flew combat aircraft during the Korean War. So began the Korean War. It is not our purpose to go into all the full details of the Korean War. We just want to show how the illogical logic of the Cold War worked. Anything that occurred in the competition between the USA and the USSR was liable to bring forth yet more momentum for the Cold War. Stalin had been sitting on the sidelines until a few things happened. First, Mao Zedong's armies had finally managed to defeat the nationalists in the Chinese Civil War. Secondly, Stalin now had the nuclear bomb. Thirdly, the USA had removed its troops from Korea. All of this made Stalin feel confident in giving Kim permission to fully execute the civil war in Korea. Eventually, the USA and its allies would fight in Korea under the banner of the newly formed United Nations. The United Nations had been formed in October 1945 after the Second World War was over. It had been the pet project of US President Franklin Roosevelt. The UN contained an inner core of the powerful nations called the UN Security Council. The Security Council at this stage consisted of the USA, the USSR, the United Kingdom, France and China. Note that the China that we are talking about here was not mainland China led by Mao Zedong and his Communist Party. This was the China of Chiang Kai-shek, which was based on the island of Taiwan. At this point in time, the Western powers refused to recognize Communist China as being the real China. The vote for the USA to lead UN forces into the Korean Peninsula against North Korea was made in the Security Council on the 25th of June 1950. The USSR as a member of the Security Council had the power to veto this vote and that would have been enough to block the intervention. Or at least it would have thrown the USA's plans into chaos. But Stalin was sulking at this time and as a result, the USSR had boycotted the UN. The USSR had boycotted the UN largely because the UN would not allow communist China to sit in the Security Council. So here again, we see crazy logic driving forward the Cold War and making things worse. Here is insight into the US's logic regarding the Cold War. This is a quote from US President Harry Truman explaining his thinking about the U.S. intervention in Korea. Open quote. I felt that if South Korea was allowed to fall, communist leaders would be emboldened to override nations closer to our own shores. 
if the communists were permitted to force their way into the Republic of Korea without opposition from the free world, no small nation would have the courage to resist threats and aggression by stronger communist neighbors. If this was allowed to go unchallenged, it would mean a third world war. It was clear to me that the foundations and the principles of the United Nations were at stake unless this unprovoked attack on Korea could be stopped. Close quote. China would also throw in half a million men when it looked like the American-led UN forces were threatening Chinese borders. Chinese forces were able to push the American-led forces back, which came as a major shock to the Americans. This pushback by China is still regarded as one of the greatest military defeats in US history. Outside of secretly providing military airplanes and pilots, Stalin decided to sit this conflict out. But this was only because he thought that if the USSR got directly involved in Korea, the USA would be forced to use nuclear weapons. Stalin's possession of nuclear technology meant that he could be bold enough to launch Kim headlong into a war in Korea. But his not yet having a big enough nuclear arsenal meant that he couldn't countenance a nuclear war, at least not yet. This is the kind of illogical logic that would pop up again and again during the Cold War. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for today. We have reached the end of today's episode of the African Campfire Stories podcast. Check out our next episode as we continue with our Cold War Pawns series. We will turn to Asia and cover Iran. The CIA intervenes in Iran and overthrows a legitimately elected government. We also turn to the Americas and look at Fidel Castro and Che Guevara's revolution in Cuba. The USSR becomes best buddies with Castro and try to put nuclear weapons in Cuba. How would the US respond? Listen to our next episode to find out. Stay tuned. See you next time.